This is an episode you can play in school. Welcome back to- I am running out of ideas. Where I take a look at old text that might be a little hard for the modern reader and listener to understand and explain it. Today we're doing Hamlet. We're not doing a sonnet, we're doing a speech from Hamlet. The speak the speech speech that Hamlet gives. Now while the speech is not as famous as the to be or not to be speech, it is a better speech in my opinion because it has probably my favorite line in the entire play. I'll point it out when it comes, but there's also something fun for this episode. I have here a list of Shakespeare's seven virtues of playing. So this speech is a bunch of advice on how to act when you are an actor. And by the end of this video, I will have compiled the seven key points that he goes through in this video on this piece of parchment. It's a cute gimmick, right? So let's jump into it. Let me set the scene for what's going on. It's right before a play is about to happen in the court of the king. Hamlet, the prince, is talking to the actors as they are getting ready, putting on their makeup, putting on their costumes, running their lines. He, they're about to go up on stage and Hamlet, like a pompous rich kid, is telling all of them how to do their job. But the advice he gives is actually kind of good. What's the advice he gives? Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. I have to try to not sound like David Tennant when I do this. So, speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounce it to you. He's saying, say the words, say the speech, I pray you, meaning please, speak the speech, please, how I said it to you. Trippingly on the tongue, meaning fast, okay? The next line kind of explains it. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. So what he's saying is, say the speech, trippingly on the tongue, say it, Fast say it with verbal dexterity. Do not mouth it the way that I've seen some of your players mouth it. Because if you're just going to do that, I'd have the town crier speak my lines. Who's the town crier? Hear ye, hear ye! The return of King Zog is imminent! The town crier is the person in a uh, Renaissance era city who would give news to anybody who was in earshot. They would sit and they would shout, and the way they spoke kind of had this cadence to it. And he's saying, don't be like the town crier. Say the word trippingly. Don't mouth it. Uh, here's an example. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounce it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Like, that. don't, don't do that second one. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hands. And this is the first virtue of playing. Number one, do not saw the air too much with your hands. You know when people kind of make fun of actors or when an inexperienced actor is giving it a shot for the first time? One of the things you have trouble with is you don't know, what, what, what am I doing with my hands? And so people like to accentuate their words a little too much. And this is not how people talk in everyday life. Even though I'm pretty animated with my hands, if you do this a lot on stage, people take notice and they, it's like you're doing bad sign language. It's not realistic. For in the torrent, tempest, and as I may say, the very whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. I love this line. So he's saying, in the torrent and tempest, so torrent and tempest, these are storms. Like, a torrent is a heavy wind, a tempest is a grand storm. In the extremes of passion, even when your character is very sad, very happy, or very angry, you must beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. A temperance meaning to hold back and do something in its appropriate moderation. And this is the second virtue of Shakespeare's playing. Beget a temperance that gives smoothness to passion. Even if your character's very angry, you don't just want to shout and go all out. You want to behave appropriately. Temper the passion. Don't let it get lost, but... You see? Oh, it offends me to the soul to see a periwig-painted fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings. Okay. A couple words need defining in this one. So he's saying, it offends me to the soul, which is, well, next time I'm offended, that's how I'm going to say it. I'm offended to the soul to see a periwig-painted fellow, periwig meaning in a wig, but so he's saying somebody very done up. It offends me to the soul to see someone who is all done up tear a passion to tatters, to very rags. It offends me to see someone just completely ravish and go way too much hard, chew the scenery, if you know that term. Chewing the scenery means overacting. It offends me to the soul to see somebody take this passion and just 
chew it up and destroy it. All because to split the ears of the groundlings. Who are the groundlings? This one's important. The groundlings were the people in the cheap seats of the stage, which, believe it or not, the cheap seats right in front of the stage. There are no, no seats. You were on a dirt floor just standing, all kind of like in a weird mosh pit watching this play. And these were the poor, uneducated people who came to see the, you know, the sex jokes and the fights and the gore and, you know, all the raunchy spits that Shakespeare is full of. So he's saying, it offends me to see a done-up person tear a passion to tatters just to uh, uh, appease and suit the groundlings, just to make them pay attention, because they don't get subtlety. Actually, the next line is him explaining the groundlings. The groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. So he's saying all the groundlings are good for is being loud, displaying their stupidity with no explanation and no reason because they're dumb. It, he's very... Very unflattering. I wonder how the groundlings at the time took that line, or if they even understood it. I would have a fellow whip for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you avoid it. So these are two references that have kind of been lost to time, unfortunately. Uh, termagant is a old fictional deity. Not to say that termagant isn't a real god. It was a god that was never actually worshipped by real people. To invoke termagant's image is to invoke irrationality and anger, extreme viciousness and violence. Uh, and Herod is a uh, character in the Bible who was known for his gaudiness and everything was overdone, too colorful, lavish parties and just big and you, know, you get it. So he would, he would have an actor whipped for or doing, for overdoing, for or doing Termagant, being more abrasive than Termagant and more gaudy than Herod. I pray you avoid it. Please avoid it. Please don't do this. And then he completely just backtracks on what he just said by saying, Be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. And that's the next virtue of playing. Be not too tame neither. You need to temper your passions, but be not too tame. Those passions are still there. Let your own discretion be your tutor. This is, could be the first example of what we now call the method in acting. Emotional recall, you remember a moment in your life when you felt the way your character feels and you call upon your behavior and your feeling and your thoughts in that moment. Let your own discretion be your tutor. Let your own discretion, let your own thoughts, your own memory, your own behavior tell you how to act. As some directors would say, go with your instinct. This next line is probably the most famous from this speech and is the next commandment on the list. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Let your movements be deliberate. Let your words be deliberate. Everything you do and say on stage in a scene is done and said for a reason and let that show. Let them match and go together. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. With this special, or step not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing. This is the next commandment. Or step not the modesty of nature. Do not go further than nature. Do not go into the extremes that you don't really see in nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing. He's saying overdoing things, overacting, it takes away from the purpose of playing. The reason you're here is destroyed. The reason you're doing this, the reason you're acting, the thing you're acting for is destroyed when you overdo it. What is the purpose of playing? Well, so the purpose of playing, whose end from the first and now was and is. So he's saying for all time, both from the first, from the beginning to now, the purpose of playing was and is, always has been, always will be, to hold as twere the mirror up to nature to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, the very age and body of the time, his own form and pressure. <sighs> Dude, doesn't literature just do it for you sometimes? So he's saying the purpose of playing, the purpose of acting, the purpose of doing all of this is to show the world itself, to hold the mirror up to nature, to show virtue, to show beauty and strength and good things, their own feature to show scorn and all the bad and negative things, their own image, to show the age, the time that we live in, the very society and moment in which we are standing, its own form and pressure, to
to make you look at what you're already seeing, but actually see it this time. Dude, dude, this isn't even my favorite line. My favorite line is coming up. This is not my favorite part of the speech. It, huh. This is my favorite line in the entire speech, right here. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. Oh, okay, er, uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I'm way too happy about this. So he's saying overdoing acting or coming tardy off underdoing, so overdoing and underdoing, it, though it make the unskillful laugh, though it make the, the groundlings, the people who don't get it, the people who don't understand, though it may make them laugh, they'll enjoy it, it cannot but make the judicious grieve. Those who actually are here with a care and a critical eye, they will grieve even if the idiots are laughing. I just want to say, the next time that, like, you're watching a show that everyone around you seems to like and you don't, a really good pompous way to say that is, though it make the unskillful laugh, this cannot but make the judicious grieve. It's just the censure of which one in your allowance must o'erweigh a whole theater of others. This actually is the sixth virtue. He's saying that the censure, meaning the disapproving. So the judicious audience that is disapproving of you must in your allowance overweigh a theater of others. Even if everyone is laughing, if somebody gets it and they disapprove, that's more important. So the sixth virtue of Shakespeare's playing is the judicious audience or ways the unskillful one. Okay, this next bit is a chunk and it's a little wordy and it's gonna be intimidating at first, but just bear with me, we're gonna get through it real quick. Oh, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, having neither the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I had thought that some of Journey's nature men had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. Okay, okay, take it one bit at a time. He's saying, there have been players, there have been actors that I have seen play and heard others praise. So there are some actors that I've seen and I've heard a lot of people praise them, even highly, they highly praise them. And to speak bluntly, they didn't have the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man. He's saying that these people, that these actors that were playing, they didn't act like people. They didn't act like anybody he'd seen. No Christian he had seen, no pagan he had seen, no man he had seen. But they strutted and bellowed in this abominable imitation of humanity. And he thought that some of nature's journeymen, meaning nature itself, he thought that these men, these players that he's seen, that they were a little... They weren't made well. Nature kind of dropped the ball making these people, but these are players that have gotten praise. You ever have that actor who you think is not that great, but everybody seems to love them? For some reason, everybody can just enjoy their presence, but you're like, this person is not, this isn't good. This is, this is bad. This is actively bad. Why is anyone liking it? So the next part of the speech, uh, the, one of the actors says something to Hamlet, and then Hamlet responds, oh, reform it altogether, which that's really not important. What is important is this next sentence, which is the seventh and final virtue on the list. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. The seventh virtue is speak no more than is set down for you. Do not improvise if it is not an improvisational play. Don't add your cute jokes. Don't do your little nods. Don't do your crazy stuff to ruin the play because you think it's funny. Though it make the unskillful laugh, he goes on to describe these actors by saying, for there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. So what he's saying here is that these actors, they find it funny to make some barren quantity, some quantity meaning an amount, and barren in this case meaning nothing going on, dumb. It makes them laugh to make stupid people in the crowd laugh. And that's... That's, that's not good. Don't do that. Just because some idiots in the crowd find you funny doesn't mean that you should do it. Because, in the meantime, there be some necessary question of the play to then be considered. What he's saying is when you do this, when you go off script and when you try to make people laugh because you're the star and you want all the attention, it really does degrade the quality of the play. And everyone in the crowd kind of like... 
they can they, they should start to question whether or not this is really a good production and really if they're wasting their time and money by being here because this is clearly, you know, not a professional thing to do. Shakespeare then just says, this is villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Be if you do this, if you are an attention hog by going off script and ruining the play, it's because you have a pitiful, a sorrowful, something that we should feel sorry for you for, ambition. It's really a sad want to be the center of attention in the middle of a play that isn't about you. You are a fool when you use it. And after all this advice, Shakespeare then closes the speech by saying, go, make you ready. Which is, which just means go get, get ready. I didn't, do I have to describe that one? Do, do really? So this is normally where I give my interpretation of the text we just looked over, but there's not much interpreting to be done here. We did that in the explanation itself, and we even have this nice list of tips and tricks to follow when acting. So instead of interpretation, let's just read the list of virtues and dedicate them to memory if you have any kind of interest in film or theater. Do not saw the air too much with your hands. Beget a temperance that gives smoothness to passion. Be not too tame neither. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Or step not the modesty of nature, the judicious audience or ways the unskillful one, and speak no more than is set down for you. With these seven tips, you're probably going to be a better actor than a lot of your peers. So go, make you ready. Okay, now that we know what the language says, let's run through it one more time so you can hear it with fresh ears. Hi, this is me in the future editing this video. As some of you may have noticed, I recite some of the lines a little off. Like, I don't say them verbatim as they are written. Don't worry, the meaning is all still correct. You're still getting good information. I'm just giving you a warning that I'm about to recite the speech and... I don't say it exactly as Shakespeare wrote it, but the meaning and the essence of each line is still there. So before you go in the comments to flex on the fact that I messed up, I, I know, I know. And if you're flexing in the comments already, don't you feel stupid for doing it preemptively before seeing this warning, right? Yeah, don't be mean to strangers. All right, back to the video. I love this one. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as leave the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hands, eh? but use all gently. For in the torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Hmm? Oh, it offends me to the soul to see a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who are capable of nothing more than inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have a fellow whipped for outdoing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you, avoid it. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. With this special, or step not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and last, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature. To show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censor of the which one must in your allowance or weigh a whole theater of others. Ah, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and highly that, not to speak too profanely, Having neither the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought that some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. Oh, reform it altogether. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. In the meantime, some necessary questions of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous, and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make you ready. Go. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really dug this one. Uh, other places where you can experience me are on screen right now. And you know, just subscribe to YouTubers that you like. Just do that. Just subscribe to YouTubers that you like. Seriously, I hope that this made your homework easier, or made class time a little more fun, or just made Shakespeare a little more attainable to people who are intimidated by the language. 
So go forth, I will see you soon, and until next time, oh turnip top! Good night.